Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Y'all are ready for the holiday. We're excited, it sounds like. This morning, we're going to be in Lesson 64 if you're following along in your homework. Uh, before we begin, I ask Dennis to lead us in a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for the day you've given us, the opportunity to be here, to come with one another, to study your word, to worship you, to compete with you. Our text for this study will be John chapter 10, if you want to start turning over there to John chapter 10. In our last study, well, not our last study, but last Sunday... We looked at in John chapter 8 where Jesus started using the I am statements. And do you remember how that ended for him? What did they do after they heard him say I am enough times? They went to stone him. Because when he said I am, what did that equivalent himself to? God. Jehovah, Yahweh. Elohim, the God of Moses that spoke to him in the burning bush. The God that they had built their whole nation upon that brought them through the exodus that was there in the fire and in the cloud that was there taking them through the ten plagues. The God of Moses. And so that was, why was that a stoning offense? That was considered blasphemy. Because what is blasphemy? What did you say? Speaking against God. Speaking against God, that's right. And I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, y'all correct me. I think that's from the Latin, the, the English word blasphemy. I think it's from Latin. But the word, when you break it down, it just means blast the fame is where that word comes from. And so you're blasting someone's fame. Today we would call that uh, being liable or uh, something like that. It's where you're taking someone's fame and you're running their fame by something you say. And specifically... Speaking against God is a death penalty offense. And so if he was not who he claimed to be, then they were right to stone him. And so that was where we were at in John chapter 8. Well, today we're going to be looking at another I am statement, actually a couple of them. He's going to talk about himself being the good shepherd. I'm sure most of you have thought of God or Jesus as your shepherd at some point. Even though 
maybe many of us don't deal with sheep or deal with sheep in the manner in which they did. All right, this will be a fun question. How many of y'all have ever raised sheep? Couple there. Any in the middle? Any in the side? All right. So about three different families have raised sheep. This is one of those, you know, sometimes I should keep my mouth shut. I probably shouldn't say this. When I was showing animals, we had a, a school farm. The school farm had hogs, used to have horses, but someone abused the horses, so they got rid of the horse area, cattle, and sheep. And this is not true of every city. This is not true of y'all. I'm not being rude. But in Lawton, the school farm was divided this way. Those that couldn't afford cattle, hogs. Those that could afford cattle, the men. And the women all did sheep. I don't know why it was that way, but it was always that way that all the girls loved to show sheep. The guys loved to show cattle, and when they couldn't afford to, they showed hogs. So I never showed a sheep. Uh, so y'all know more than I do. <laughs> um, all I remember is lots of screaming. They scream pretty loud, don't they? Especially when you're cutting their hair. Uh, but a hog does too. Woo! Whew. I'll never forget the sound of a screaming hog. And they stink. But they also aren't very good at taking care of themselves. Do they need you to cut their hair? Yes. What happens if we don't cut their hair? They get sick, right? Or they could even die. Uh, they have to be taken care of. We've domesticated, and by we I mean all the way back to at least 2,000 years ago, maybe almost since the beginning of time. We've domesticated sheep so much they really, really, really rely upon their shepherd. If they're left on their own, they're going to be in bad shape. Uh, so what is our famous shepherd passage that we normally think of? Don't tell me John chapter 10. We know that's not it. What's our famous shepherd passage? Psalm 23, right? I think it is one of the most quoted psalms in the death and dying and funeral process. Um, it has been quoted at many famous events by many famous people. I believe it was quoted on the Titanic while it was going down. A lot of people, when they're dying, quote 23rd Psalm. Why? Why is it associated with death? Probably that one little phrase. Yea, though I walk through the valley of death, thou art with me. We want God to be there with us when we're going through that time. And so a lot of people quote it during a time of death. But that's not the only time described in the 23rd Psalm. Is that the only time God is our shepherd is when we're dying? No, he's not. Our text, actually, a lot of it comes from Ezekiel 34. But let's first go to the most famous. Let's go to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And just like I have used this at many funerals, I think there are a plethora of sermons from Psalm 23. I'm sure y'all have heard a lot of sermons from this passage. I'm just going to read it and then let y'all make comments because you've probably heard a ton of sermons on this in your life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want... He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters or besides waters of rest. Waters that I am still at. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness or in the right paths for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or the deep darkness valley. 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, or only, goodness and mercy, or steadfast love, shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell or return to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Or the Hebrew says, for length of days. All right, y'all teach me anything you want about Psalm 23. How about that? If we get bored, then I'll poke you, prod you but I'm sure you know a lot. So what do we know about Psalm 23? Yes. Matt said he's always liked how personal it is. And I think I may have already done that once here, but one of my favorite ways is to emphasize the me's in that passage and the I's. All right, anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Like Jesus, he used an example that they were familiar with in so many ways they understood it. Um, David would not have said these things if he did not understand these things. One of the things I really liked at Branson when I was there, and I may, we may do this later because it was so good, he went to many of these psalms and prayers and talked about how they understood those things. Because it would mean something completely different for David. What did David do when he was a child? He was a shepherd. It means something different for David to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Because he can picture that. That's the way he was raised. That would be... Like someone saying, the Lord is my carpenter. He builds my house perfectly. He makes sure everything is lined up in accordance to His will. And every nail is drove to where it will never come out again. The wood shall not split and the roof shall last forever. You see, it makes such a difference, and they were talking about prayer, and I think that's a really good study we may do in the future. A lot of the prayers and a lot of the psalms were written from a personal place. And it doesn't mean the same thing. We can study it and understand it somewhat, but it doesn't mean the same thing for me to pray to God, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't mean the same thing for me as it did for David. It would mean something more for me if I used my vocation when I described it. The Lord is my preacher. He always has the right words for me. He knows the applications I need to my life. He never forgets to say the things that touch me in the heart. It means a different thing if I say, The Lord is my manufacturer. He always makes sure everything is built correctly. The Lord is my carpenter. The Lord is my teacher. He always writes the things down I need to read on the board. You see, it's completely different if it's your vocation that's being described. And so David was a shepherd. It was his life. All right, anything else from Psalm 23? Yes, sir. Mm. Uh, it made sense to me that he shared Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So Jesus was describing not only the green grass that feeds, but the water that you feel safe to drink from. Still water sheep will drink from, but they won't drink from moving water. If it scares them. Yes. Yeah. 
Mm. So two and three is what God provides for us physically. Verse four is safety. Verse five is, what was five? Nourishment. Nourishment. And then six is the future. And you notice that a lot of the terminology in verse six is spiritual. It's made a change now to what we really are looking forward to. All right, that's what we think of when we think of the good shepherd. But actually... I want us to think about Ezekiel 34 as we think about today's lesson. And once again, I'll do all the reading so it can be online if someone needs it. But then I'd love y'all's comments. All right, Ezekiel 34, and right... Just for ease, I had marked this in the NKJV. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. All right. When Jesus is going to talk in a moment, he is going to compare himself to the shepherds in Israel and tell how they failed. And he's telling him, Tell the shepherds how they failed. Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they scatter, they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became food for every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds felled themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherd, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, And the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. So first he condemns the shepherds for what they did and how they have mistreated the flock, how the flock fled from them. And then when it didn't have a shepherd, it was unsafe and it got attacked. And now he's taking the flock away from them. But if that was the end of the story, if just he took the flock away from them, we're still in a pretty bad spot. We need a new shepherd. Let's keep reading. For thus says the Lord, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. Who's going to become the new shepherd? God. When are we going to see that? John 10. I myself will be the shepherd and seek them out as a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold. Notice that reminds you of something. And feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. Sound like Psalm 23? I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says the Lord. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. And he is not talking about the sheep there. He's talking about the bad shepherds, remember? And feed them in judgment. And as for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I will judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with the feet the residue of your pasture and have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? As for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. So he says, even once he is gathering up, not just the shepherds are bad, there's going to be some amongst the flock that are bad. And he's going to separate them. Therefore, says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, scattered them abroad, therefore I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey. I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. Pause for a moment. Was David alive in Ezekiel's time? Or after Ezekiel's time? No. He was long since dead. So who will be the one shepherd? David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Who is supposed to be a descendant of David? The Messiah, the Christ. Who became a descendant of David? Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. Ah, I wish I could read this whole thing. All right. I want you to have in mind, and we really could have read that whole chapter. Ezekiel 34, because when Jesus is claiming to be the I am, he is claiming to be God. But in this passage, he's not only claiming to be God, but he's saying, I am the good shepherd. Who was the good shepherd? The one that God said he was going to shepherd, and then he was going to set up a shepherd. He was both of those. He was God who shepherded his people. Now he's the good shepherd shepherding his people. He matches perfectly up with Ezekiel, and Ezekiel matched up with what God was like as a shepherd in Psalm 23. And John 10, the bad guys, the current shepherds, the leaders of Israel, had been just like the bad shepherds. And Jesus is going to tell us that too. All right, let's start with talking about shepherds in the first century. What do you all know about shepherds in the first century? There are two main workers. And Jesus is going to describe the difference in those, and he's going to also throw in there a hired hand. But what's the two main workers? The shepherd and the doorkeeper. Do you know the difference in the two jobs? It's as different as day and night. The shepherd is, and in Jesus' description, the shepherd is the one that owns, the hireling is the one that doesn't own, but, the, but that falls into almost a third division here. The two main divisions, the shepherd and doorkeeper. The shepherd keeps them during the day. Doorkeeper keeps them during the night. Okay? So... We have mangers, we have barns, we have things like that that we still use today. But that is not what's being described here with the doorkeepers. The doorkeepers is more like a corral. Um, and they go into the corral during the night to be protected. And these corrals were large. They hired a doorkeeper to protect them at night from two different things that Jesus is going to describe. One thing goes over the wall. And another thing, mostly during the day with the shepherds, is the animals try to get to them. Wolves and things like that. At night, the wolves aren't going to do as good of a job at getting to them. Why? Because they're protected. They're in the wall. So the only thing that really goes over a wall is thieves. And thieves will go over the wall and steal and kill. And so the doorkeeper will keep them inside the wall, which means the predators can't get to them, but he'll also keep 
the thieves from getting to them. And so they're in a corral, would be the way we would say it today. Now the shepherd, where are they at? Out in the field. And so in the daytime, you let them out into your field. They eat, drink, and are protected by the shepherd. All right, let's get into the two main workers now. Jesus is the door. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly. What's that mean, guys? I'm telling the truth. Or the literal translation of that word would be, Amen, Amen. I'm telling you the truth. Listen up. All right? So I'm telling you the truth. I say to you, I am. This is what we looked at in John chapter 8. Ego and me. This is that blasphemous phrase. I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. All right. Let's start by thinking about the door. So what is the door and the doorkeeper's main job? To keep them safe at night. Good. And what is the main predator at night? It's not an actually an animal, is it? It's thieves. And so Jesus is telling them that they have been attacked by thieves and robbers. And what did the thieves and robbers do in these verses? They stole and they killed and they destroyed. And what did the sheep do when they were being killed, stolen, and destroyed to the thieves? Verse 8. They didn't hear them. They have had a lot of lousy teachers for a long time. Do you notice that's one of the big things? I mean, Jesus does great miracles, and that will inspire the crowds. But you notice one of the phrases, one of the comments that keeps getting made over and over through his ministry? People keep saying, what about his teaching? They don't teach us like you do. He teaches differently. He teaches with authority. Phrases like that keep getting said over and over and over. Why? People aren't used to hearing someone that they're wanting to listen to. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the teachers of his day did not teach like he taught. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm looking to my corners. I need my wings to help me this morning, okay, guys? That way y'all can prove I'm not lying, all right? When y'all pull your truck in, do your cattle know the sound of your vehicle? All right, yeah. I have done it, seen it, been around it over and over and over where there is one particular feed truck that comes often enough they know that vehicle. We'll pull on a farm to go fishing and all of our cars do about nothing to the cattle. But if that truck pulls on the farm, they come running, right? Yeah. Really? 
Yep. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Arthur was saying, I'll repeat in case y'all didn't hear. He, he, he's kind of like me and Harley. He's pretty good at speaking loud, but I'll repeat it. Uh, on the dairy farm, he said that there was a pecking order and certain cows had to be culled. And then when they came, others would follow. And when we get into the shepherd in our next slide, that's what Jesus says. He knows them by name. So what Harley was describing as the door, the door is open in the morning by the doorkeeper. But the sheep don't just come running out. They're safe in that corral. They only come running out when their shepherd calls them. Um, yeah. In Mongolia, the daytime was probably pretty similar to the daytime here. The nighttime may have been a little different. They didn't have any fences. It was a fenceless country. It was still a nomadic herding country where the animals go wherever they wish. It's also true of cars. It's not just animals. We would go to, like, we went to a funeral one time and we went to a vacation one time with the, or a, a church retreat one time. And they're just driving along the highway and then whoop! Wherever they find a spot in a field they want to start driving, they just start driving through all the fields. I'm like, how do you know where you're going? I don't think they knew where they're going. I don't know. Just wherever you wound up is where you're going, I guess. Well, the cattle and the sheep and the camels, no, not cam yeah, camels, yaks, um, all the animals were that way in Mongolia too. They would free roam and you would see a cow way off in someone else's field, by someone else's house, everything else. And I asked them, how do they get them back? And they said, when they want to come back, they know where their farmer is. They're going to find them. Now, some of the farmers would use hawks to find their animals. Um, but they could go for the winter time to the capital city for three or four months and then come back in the spring and find their animals just randomly wherever they had roamed during all that time. Different concept. Um, we were, maybe you were talking about something else in Mongolia. We talk about this a lot with the Good Shepherd. Let's go ahead and go to the Good Shepherd. They know his voice and he knows them by name. One of the things we found in Mongolia was it didn't matter how crowded you were. I'm, we take crowds funny in Oklahoma. If there's two cars on Main Street, it's a, it's a traffic jam here, right, guys? Uh, we were in one to two hour traffic jams to go two to three miles every time we went anywhere. And when you went in the grocery store, there were thousands of people in the grocery store that you're pushing past and everything. But the longer we were there, the more my kids and us got to know each other's voices. We could be amongst thousands at a movie theater, at a grocery store, anywhere, and Chris and the kids would say, I hear your dad, he's over there. And we'd walk till we found each other because our voices became that distinctive in the crowd where we could tell, A, the English, but B, each other's voices to where we could find each other no matter what. And so we didn't fear because we could hear our kids even amongst that giant crowd. Um, that is what Jesus does. He knows them by name. They know his voice. Let's look at that. John chapter 11, six, 11 chapter 10, 11. Chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. Ezekiel's brought to your mind there. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, I want you to pause there. That's just, Jesus is going to compare back and forth good shepherds, bad shepherds, um, hirelings, but there's almost no shepherds that will lay down their life for a sheep. I mean, that they're going to fight for an animal, but historically they say that 
You're going to fight for an animal, but if you think it's going to cost your life, even a shepherd that owns the animals isn't going to give his life for the animal. So he's, and I'm not changing the Bible here, but I almost want to say he's a better shepherd. <laughs> because good shepherds love their sheep. They're their own sheep. They paid good money for them. They're going to take care of them. But very few shepherds ever die for their sheep. He died for us. He who is a hired hand, now this is talking about daytime again. So he who is the shepherd of the day, but he doesn't own the sheep. He's just the hired hand. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. See, I think you almost have two rankings here. You have the good shepherd that will die for his sheep, the shepherd who is going to protect his sheep, and then the hireling that just runs. Uh, the job is just a paycheck, and if it costs me much, if it's very difficult on me, it's too hard, I'm just going to run. Now, think about that amongst teachers in Israel, but it can be true even amongst Christians today. We got Jesus that's willing to do anything for us. We're supposed to be willing to do a lot for each other. But then oftentimes, the first sign of hardship, we run like someone that's not invested. He said the teachers were that way. They only wanted the sheep to get fat off of them, is what Ezekiel told us. They only wanted whatever they could give them. It was a taking relationship, not a giving relationship. And so when you only take from your sheep, what did Ezekiel tell us? Eventually, the sheep did not listen to them. What does Jesus tell us? The sheep don't listen to them. They only hear the voice of their shepherd, the one who cares. He flees because he's a hired hand. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. He started and ended this section saying, I'm going to die for you. I'm a different type of shepherd. And I have other sheep. Now he changes topics really here. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. What fold? The fold he's talking to right now. I must bring them on also and they will listen to my voice so there is, will be one flock, one shepherd. All right, so Jesus is the good shepherd. How do we know he's the good shepherd? Because he lays down his life for his sheep. He repeats that at the beginning and end. How do the sheep treat the good shepherd? They listen to him. They know Him, He knows them. They know Him like He knows the Father. That's intimate knowledge. Then He brings up a second fold, and a lot of people get really confused with the second fold when we put modern day glasses on a conversation that was happening back then. And we look around our world, and people want to find the second fold throughout the whole world. He tells us where the second fold and the first fold is. He says, You are... In my fold, you are my sheep. Who's he talking to? The Jews that were listening to him that day. <laughs> they are the fold. So where is he going to go get from the second fold? The Gentiles. Which Gentiles? He tells us. I have other sheep, not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be... One flock, one shepherd. I know I maybe I talk too much and y'all can get mad at me. It's okay. A lot of people do. This is not talking about denominationalism. That's a modern day view put on this passage. This passage, he was talking to his fold and saying, later there's going to be another fold and I'm going to bring in the ones that listen to my voice. If we were saying, I'm okay, you're okay, let's shake hands and all be okay, that doesn't require listening to his voice. Because if every group is okay, then that means you don't have to obey. 
Because every group cannot be okay and obey. That's the most idiotic thing pushed forward today. We would never do that in any other thing in society. You cannot do one thing and I do another thing and we both be right. We're either both wrong or only one of us is right. So if we're listening to His voice, we are in His fold. Whether we are Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, black or white, Hispanic or American. I didn't mean to say you can't be a Hispanic American. Uh, Spanish speaking, English speaking, that would be a better way to say it. Sorry. All right. Jesus loves us all, but we have to listen to him, hear his voice, and he's got to know us, and we got to know him. Thank <laughs> you. 
services here at the Miami Church. Uh, we're going to welcome all of you, especially some of our visitors. Uh, I was trying to scan the room, um, and if I missed you, I'm sorry, but uh, Kim has some friends from Tex Texas. Megan and her kids are here with us, so we'd like to welcome them. Um, if there's others that I missed, if you would, if, if we do have a visitor. Where, where are you pointing, GW? Oh, she's back with us. Okay. <laughs> she's not a visitor, but we're happy that she's back with us. But if you'd like to fill out a visitor's card, there's one at the end of the pew, and you can put that in the, play at the back of the room. Um, several things, uh, I suppose. Uh, just uh, be sure and get a copy of the bulletin, because there's things that I won't announce from up here. But there are three uh, upcoming events that I will give you a reminder. Uh, Wednesday, next Wednesday, we'll have popsicles in the grass. Uh, next um, Saturday, uh, the 9th, we'll have... Uh, Family Fun Day at the at Calvin and Tory's place at 5:30, and then on the 10th, uh, Granby, Missouri, will be hosting Tri-State Youth Series. Um, so those are some things that are upcoming. Uh, Barbara Hayworth's nephew, uh, Josh Walker, is still having issues with his eyes. Uh, I guess they're getting worse, so we need to keep him in our prayers. Uh, was told that the Bruffs went on a nice cruise, came home yesterday, and uh, all three, I guess, brought home COVID, so they're at home. So we need to keep them in our prayers. Um, talked to Judy, Judy Bryan this morning. Uh, Steve is still about the same. Uh, she was ready to come to church today and kind of got nauseated, queasy at her stomach. So she decided to stay home. So we need to continue to keep them in our prayers. Um, so our scheduled services this morning, uh, Kendall Hunt will have our song service. Uh, David Davis will have our opening prayer. Jackson Kime will be leading our thoughts on the Lord's communion or Lord's supper. Uh, Bryce Pogue will have our scripture reading, and that will be 1 John 4, 20 and 21. And then Will Brassfield will um, have our closing prayer. So let's take a moment and clear our minds of uh, all worldly thoughts and prepare to worship our Lord. Our song before our opening prayer this morning will be number 797. 797. Lord, we come before thee now at thy feet. Thank you. 
Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for Jesus that he came to this earth and lived a perfect life, gave us the example, and then went to the cross. They killed him, Father, and then he rose again so that we might have hope. Father, we ask that you would be with us in this service this morning. We ask that you would continue to be with Steve and Judy, be with Rosemary. We're thankful for Virginia's improvement and she's able to be back with us ask you to be with the Bruffs, be with Trevor's mother in the hospital. Father, be with all the families that are traveling this summer. Keep them safe. and Be with our seniors. Help them know how much we love them. Embolden them, Father, to share the things that are on their mind and to drip on us. They're wise words and we want to hear them. Well, I'm going to ask you to be with our young. Help us do and say the right things to fortify them in their faith and give them courage against all the temptations that are in front of them. There are many. Father, this morning we ask you to be with Kendall as he leads us in song and Zane as he brings us the message. Be with our communion leader and give him ready recollection of the things that they've prepared. Father, we pray that all we do and say during this worship is glorifying to you and encouraging to those around us. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Number 364, 364, this will be our song before we partake the Lord's Supper, before Jackson gives us some thoughts for that Lord's Supper. 364. We gather here in Jesus' name. 
His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger To help prepare our minds, I th thought it was easy to say something simple in the sense of I'm going to be reading from Isaiah, the chapter 53. I'm going to read all of it. And instead of me saying something, I thought it best the scripture to say something all by itself. So as I read uh, chapter 53, try to help you place your mind in the sense of thinking what Christ did for us and what he went through as I read this. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, for appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he has or he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men, Yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. 
But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offering. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge of the righteous one. My servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded the transgressors. Will you bow with me? Dear Lord, we come before you now as we partake in eating the bread, which represents your son's body. As we partake of it, and it reminds us of it, let us keep in mind what Christ had done to, to just the great gift that he had done for us and all the pain that he went through. And we can never thank you for that. Enough thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Dear Lord, we come before you again as we are about to drink the fruit of the cup, which represents the, the blood of Christ, the precious and holy blood that was spilled on that cross. And it not only cleansed us of our sins through our baptism, but it also reminds us of the covenant that we have made with you through the baptism. It reminds us of all the things that we are promising to do, to live by your word and to live for you and to do our best to bring others to you. So as we drink this, let us let it remind us of the pain that he went through and the salvation that we are able to gain in others as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, out of convenience, uh, we also give a prayer and as a reminder to that we give to the church so that the, the whatever is given can be used to, to better the kingdom and to uh, be used in a way that can glorify God. Dear Lord, we come before you now as a reminder to ourselves of so much that you have given to us of all the good things that we are given daily, of being able to see your world every morning and all the great things that you have created and all the animals and all of the vegetation that you have created and also each other that you have created. It is incredible that we see all that you have created and given to us. And especially the greatest gift that you've given to everyone, your son, and allowing him to die on the cross for, our, uh, for us, to take all of our sins on that cross. And that is the greatest gift that we can never repay, but we can always do our best. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Number 896. 896. My Lord has gone so wondrous life and further texture fills his to this heart. you're following in your uh, hymnal, mark number 930 for the song of invitation. 900, 930 will be the song of invitation. And before the scripture reading and the lesson this morning, we're going to sing number 898. 898. As I travel through life with its trouble and strife,
As I roam the hillside, or I lift to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the air, as my picture is there of the land of and fair, where the radio flowers prevail. The scripture reading this morning will come from 1 John chapter 4 and verses 20 and 21 from the New American Standard Bible. If someone says, I love God, and yet he hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Well, good morning, everybody. I know y'all are avid readers of the bulletin, and it is beautifully done, and I'm not bragging on myself on that. Um, but I thought I would start by reading my bulletin article to y'all. I know you know about the holiday this weekend. You're all excited about it. My one-year anniversary at Miami, right? Not 4th of July. Come on, guys. Um, let me read y'all what I wanted to say to you. We're happy to have been part of the family in Miami for one year now. This is the paper anniversary. That anniversary shows that life is still a blank sheet of paper, and we get to write on it what we want. However, there's already been a lot of story written in the last year. Some of these memories are written in tears, in hugs, in songs, and in praise. We've grown in numbers, in education, in doctrine, reproof, correction, in works, in outreach, in fellowship, and in study. Let's look at some of those facts. You know, as a missionary, once a month we send out a mission report and that was on the work. It's hard how you word all that because it was on the work we were doing in Mongolia, but the work is never done by ourselves. It's what the Lord's church is doing, but mostly it's what God is doing. And so I want to read some of the facts of what we did in the last year. This is not me, okay? Our auditorium Bible classes. In the last year, we have studied Moses and the Law, 
the armor of God, the Holy Spirit, the reaching out clinic, the first 65 lessons of the life of Christ. This was accompanied by 65 homework assignments and reading one whole commentary, The Life of Christ, Volume 1. We had a lot of sermon series over the last year. We studied what the Bible says, WTBS, what the Bible says about different topics. Leadership, elders, deacons, and a little bit on our preacher. James and Jesus, what they both have to say about the same things. Nineveh, what Jonah and another Old Testament prophet told us about Jonah. Old Testament character studies. We looked at the character of different famous Old Testament characters and what type of character they lived. And the life of Christ, years 1 through 33. Now the last six months is our next six months. Now, we've had a lot of Bible reading together. Last November, we had a Thanksgiving reading where every week, every day we read and then we wrote a passage. In December, we read a proverb every week, every day, excuse me. We read a proverb every day, but I ask you to write down your favorite proverb every week. We read through the Gospel according to Matthew two times already, Mark two times, Luke once, and John once. Luke and John will get another time next month and the month after that. We've also had a lot of changes. Some sad, some happy, some to rejoice over, some to cry while rejoicing. We had three pass away last year. We had one birth and one marriage. We had two graduate high school, four graduate post-secondary school programs, three families place membership, two baptisms, two gospel meetings with Brother Jenkins and Brother Clayball, three outreach Sundays, and two door knockings. We had a lot of food and fellowship. One meal for the homeless, one Thanksgiving meal for the whole community, Christmas baskets made for many, 38 Sunday lunches. I think that might be a record for y'all. I don't know. That's a lot of lunches provided. Four popsicle feeds, eight family fun days. Our youth did a lot this last year. We had eight youth attend camp, seven youth, including two junior youth, attend LTC, 75 attend TSYS at Miami. And we as a congregation sent support to 10 different missionary efforts in the last year. We've done a lot together in this last year. The Lord has worked a lot in Miami and throughout the world. Miami and throughout the world. I can't believe I did that after a year. <laughs> Miami and throughout the world because of us and our work and our giving and our supporting. And if you heard any of those things that you said, I didn't know that or I didn't get to be a part of that, Maybe you can be a part this year. Maybe this year we'll have even more baptisms, more place membership, more, I don't know, about marriages or children. Um, I don't know if we want to say we want more deaths, but we're glad that we know those that die in the Lord go to meet Him in heaven one day. Oh, and one more way of announcement before I get behind the pulpit. In case you didn't know where I was Wednesday, apparently uh, there's some rumors. And if those rumors got to you, ask your elders if I'm leaving. That's up to them. Now, I, I was not trying out for a job Wednesday, guys. Um, Sayer Church of Christ was having their summer series. Every sun Wednesday they have a different guest preacher. And Sayers, where Billy Clayball is from, that did our gospel meeting. When I asked him to do our meeting, he asked me to do their Wednesday. And so we drove the five or so hours down there. They put us in a nice hotel. And the church at Leedy that we worked with for eight years led out Wednesday night services, and they came over 
to Sayer and saw us too. So we got to see friends from Sayer and Leedy. And the message I presented there was on the life of Christ, and we're going to hear that this afternoon. So please come back. Do you want to live forever? If you hear that question and think about it, some of us immediately would say, no, I see some heads already shaking no. You don't want to live forever because if I live forever, that means I will outlive my spouse, my children, and even my grandchildren, and I may wind up lonely one day. If I live forever, that means I have to go through more and more pain and more difficulty. I have to live through more epidemics and pandemics and sicknesses that go throughout our world. I have to live through more depressions and inflations. It means that I have to live through more horrible presidents. And then eventually the fall of America, if the world lasts that long, we're going to see, if I live forever, many rises and falls of new nations on this planet. If I live forever, that means that I'm going to have countless fears. And innumerable times I sin. And innumerable times I fail God and my family and friends. And so when someone asks the question, do I want to live forever? I might say no. But you know, if I ask you the question, do you want eternal life? Live forever and eternal life are the same thing. They just bring two different things to our mind. If I said, do you want eternal life? You would say, yes, I want eternal life because if I have eternal life, when I live forever in eternity in heaven, I will never sin again. I'll never disappoint God again. I'll never disappoint my family or friends. I won't have to live past anyone dying because I'll never lose another spouse, child, or grandchild, or parent. If I have eternal life, I won't experience any more pains, any more sicknesses, any more difficulties, no more pandemics, no more epidemics, no more rises and falls of nations because I will live in one nation, the kingdom of God, and it will last forever. And so if I ask you, do you want eternal life? We'll say yes. We'll quickly say, I want eternal life. And then the next question we should ask is, what do I need to do to have eternal life? That question was asked in Luke chapter 10. Let's turn there. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the funny thing is, that word does not mean that much different than live forever. When I used to translate Greek, and I'm not good at it, but just for fun, every time I would translate that life eternal. It's the same phrase. Life eternal, eternal life. But when we think of eternal life, we think of heaven. When we think of life eternal, we think of a horrible life here on earth. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And so a gentleman asked the question, how do I live forever? How do I have eternal life? This gentleman was a lawyer. The word lawyer means he studied the Old Testament law backwards and forwards. He knew every bit of it. And so what a silly question to be asking because he knew the answer. Why would you ask a silly question that you already know the answer to? Well, it tells us in the text, verse 25, he was trying to test Jesus. He was hoping to trick Jesus. And so Jesus turned the question right back around on him and he said, what should you do to inherit eternal life? What does the Old Testament and the law and the prophets tell you? 
And he said correctly, because this is the exact same answer Jesus gives when he's asked that question, Matthew twenty two thirty six. He answers from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Love God and love your neighbor. But now he's got egg on his face. He didn't trick Jesus. And so to justify himself, to try to make himself look better for not tricking Jesus, he asked a follow-up question. Was this question honest? Well, the Scripture tells us it was not. It was just to justify himself, just like the first question. But you know, a bad guy asking a bad question for bad motives gives us a good answer. If he had never asked the question to trick Jesus, we would never know the answer to eternal life unless we studied the whole Old Testament, found out, love God, love your neighbor. Or read Matthew chapter 26. If he had never asked the question, who is my neighbor, we would never have what we consider the most famous parable of Jesus, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so a bad guy with a bad question with bad motives, I'm glad because he gave us a great parable. You know, who is my neighbor is a pretty good question to ask. Because when we ask that question, many of us might immediately think of different people. It gets kind of hard to nail down who is my neighbor. So Jesus gives us what we call the parable of the Good Samaritan. Parables are like similes that you use like and as. So this technically isn't a parable, but we call it that. So we'll just go with that. The parable of the Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 36. And I'm going to tell you before you even read it, we're going to learn a different lesson than maybe you've heard before. And I think it was the lesson Jesus wanted us to hear. So pay attention. Don't just go into... Cruise control, because you've heard this a thousand times. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him and he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii. Pause there for a moment. We've looked at denarii several times recently. Two denarii is a lot of money. That's two days wages as we call it. Do you remember when Jesus was supposed to give the temple tax? He and Peter were giving for a whole year about this much money. Two denarii is a lot of money. He gave two denarii and said to the innkeeper, Take care of him. Whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. All right. He asked the question, who is the neighbor? Jesus tells the story of who is the neighbor. And then he asked him, who was the neighbor to the man who was hurt? And he said, he can't say even the Samaritan. He said, the one who helped him. He can't even admit who it was. And he probably leaves pretty ashamed. Because he had hoped to show Jesus up and Jesus just made him admit that a Samaritan could be your neighbor. And so we're going to ask the question today, who is our, who is your, who is my neighbor? Let's start with who was not acting as his neighbor, we have the priest and the Levi not being a neighbor to the wounded traveler. What did they do when they saw the man? 
They looked at the man and they saw him as a burden. They saw him as a problem. They saw him as a difficulty. They saw him as someone getting in their way when they were headed to do something more important that day. They were on their way to do God's business. And they don't have time for Him. How many people do you think we walk by and pass by on the other side? And I'm not taking this literally. I don't think the story wants us to take literally and just apply this to only when you're driving down the interstate. Okay? Let's start with who is our neighbor. A lot of times we'll say, well, if my family is in trouble, I'll take care of my family. Okay, that's fine. That's good. Okay, if my friends are in trouble, I'll take care of my friends. Sure, that's fine. That's good. Okay, people that like the same things as me, if they are a OU fan, if they like soccer, if they like cattle, not sheep, you know, whatever it might be, then I'll take care of them. But here's the problem. By the time I've worried about taking care of my family, my friends, and those with like interest in me, I probably think I'm too busy to help out anyone else. I've already done too much. I've already spent too much. I'm too far stretched. And so I'll just keep on walking for this person because I don't even know them. And if I do know them, I don't like them. They're a Samaritan. They're the worst of the worst. Wait, was the man on the ground a Samaritan? No, he was not. We're not told he was. We can only assume he was the same as the priest and the Levite. The Samaritan was the one that was different. And so here's the part I told you we're going to learn something new today. I think Jesus was actually teaching the opposite lesson we often make. Because listen to Jesus' question. Which of these three, he didn't say who on the ground, which of these three proved to be a neighbor? Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the thieves? Who proved they were a neighbor to the man among the thieves? The neighbor was the Samaritan. So let's go back to the beginning of our question and our chapter or section. The section began with, how do I have eternal life? How do I live forever? Love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. Who proved to be the neighbor to this man? The Samaritan. So the beginning of our story, we had just heard that we need to love our neighbor. And he says, but who's my neighbor? And he said, who showed himself to be the neighbor? The Samaritan. You see, so often I think we focus on us being the Samaritan looking down at the man on the ground, but I think Jesus wants us to be the man on the ground looking up the Samaritan and saying, if it had been a priest that came by, I would have let him help me. He knows more about the Bible than I do. He's closer to God than I am. He could tell me some good advice. If it had been a Levi to help me, he would be a great person to help me. You know, maybe he's got more money than I do. He may be financially well off. You know, Levites don't even have to uh, spend the money that we do. They don't have to buy the land. They don't have all those worries that we do. Maybe he can help me with my physical problem. But when it's a Samaritan that walks by me, maybe one of the people in the community or in even in our congregation that you look at them and you say, but they're not as wise as I am. They're a new Christian. They're a young parent. They're a young person. They don't have wisdom to give to me. Why would I listen to them? I look at them and I say, but I've been studying the Bible for 35 years. Any comment they have to make to me about the passage or in class or when we're talking, they can't be right. I must be right. I look at them when I have a financial issue and I say, yes, but they're not near as rich as I am or as sister so-and-so is or brother so-and-so is and so they can't help me with my financial problem. You see, I think sometimes we make a lot of Samaritans out there that we say, if it had been a priest or Levite, they could help me. 
but that's okay. You, you don't need to worry about helping me with this. I'll find another way. I don't need to listen to your advice. I'll find someone else. You can't know anything about the Bible. I know more than you. You see, Jesus actually tells us at the end, who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is the one who is the Samaritan. What are you supposed to do for your neighbor according to the two greatest laws? Love God and love your neighbor, which means when our neighbor is the person that doesn't look like us, doesn't talk like us, doesn't know as much as us, isn't as rich as us, but they offer us help, we take their help. Now, I think it'd be a lot easier for us as Christians to say, I will be the Samaritan. Why? Because we love to pull somebody else up. But Jesus is telling us, you need to love the Samaritan and let him pull you up. Help you out of the gutter when you're hurt, when you're sick, when you have a health problem, when you have some advice you need, when you have someone that you need to tell you the Scripture, don't look down on them. Listen to them. Let them. Let them give you a meal. But they don't cook as good as I do. I don't care if they cook as good as you. Let them open the can and give you a meal. But they don't know as much as I do. Well, listen to them. Maybe they do know something about this subject. Well, they couldn't have any good ideas. Well, maybe they do. Listen for a moment. When your Samaritan is trying to help you love your neighbor. That's what Jesus wants us to learn. He wants us to learn to love God. He wants us to learn to love our neighbor. How do you live forever? You love. For our challenge, I want us to notice John chapter 13. Our scripture reading was 1 John. In 1 John, he told us that the only way we can test if we're actually loving God is how we're treating our neighbor In our parable, he told us, our neighbor is the Samaritan. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, bring it closer to home. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You see, that's why most of my examples about wisdom, financial help, and physical help, and scriptural help were amongst the brethren because Jesus tells us we have to love one another. What happens when I look at the one another and I say, but they're a Samaritan. If it had been one of the elders that gave me this advice, if it had been a person that had studied their Bible for a long time, if it was one of my rich brother or sisters that offered to give me Uh, financial help, if it was one of my sisters that could cook good, I would say, bring the meal over. And he says, but when you look at them and they're a Samaritan, accept their help. Love one another. All right, so our challenge this week is, I want you to let somebody help you. I can give you the challenge of being a good Samaritan, but I think that's too easy for us. When you find yourself on the street and someone offers you help, don't judge them versus Levite, versus priest, versus Samaritan. Let them help you. Now, in this story, who is Jesus to us? As we come to our invitation, who is Jesus to us? Jesus is the Samaritan. You say, how could Jesus be the Samaritan? Well, because He came and offered us help when we still considered Him our enemy. Jesus died for us when we still hated Him. When we still considered Him our enemy, when we had not yet been saved, He showed us love. But so often... Jesus walks up to someone on the side of the road and they're like, you're my enemy, don't help me. And He's like, but I want to help you. I want to save you. I want to heal your wounds. I want to fix your problems. I'll pay the high cost of two denarii. And they say, I don't want you to help me. You're not good enough. I don't like you. You're my Samaritan. You see, that's what we're saying to Jesus when we won't accept His salvation. We're saying... You are not good enough. I won't take your help. 
love your neighbor. Jesus says to you today, I want to be your neighbor. Let me be the Samaritan that while you hated me, I wanted to help you and you let me help you. Jesus wants to help you. He wants to heal you. He wants to fix all of your pains and your problems when He finds you on the side of the road. Do you believe in Jesus? Will you turn your life to Him, confess Him, and be baptized? Come now. Call with thee now to come into the fold of safety where there is rest and room. Tenderly calling is he, wonder, wonder, come unto me, patiently waiting, there standing I see, Jesus, my shepherd divine, Jesus, the loving shepherd, gave his life for me. Tenderly now he is calling, wonder come to me. Hazel with bound is danger, and once a shepherd blessed. Into the fold of safety, into the place of rest. Lovingly, tenderly, Calling is he, wonder, wonder, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see, Jesus, my Savior, divine. Lingering is the folly, wolves are abroad today. Jesus, the loving shepherd, calling thee now to come into the fold of safety, where there is rest and room. Lovingly, tenderly calling is he, wonder, wonder, come unto me. Patiently waiting, there standing I see, Jesus, my shepherd, divine. Thank you, Zane. Great lesson. Um, just from a personal standpoint, it seems like it's, it's easy for me to do, but sometimes it's hard for to let someone do. I, I don't know why, but it's just the way it is. Maybe it is like that for you. I'm not sure. Um, but thank you for that great lesson. Thank you for all the men that served uh, this morning. Uh, I, I will stand corrected. I believe that Trevor may be the only one that has COVID, uh, but his mother Sandy is in the hospital with, a, I guess, a severe UTI. So we need to keep both of them in our prayers. Um, again, thank you for being here. Visitors, appreciate your attendance. Uh, we will have lunch in the annex next door, and then we'll come back over here at 115 for afternoon service. Anything I may have left out? Okay, Brother Will Brassfield will have our closing prayer. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we're thankful that this day we've had to come to you, come together and worship you, sing songs of praises to you. We ask that you let each one of us, let someone help us this week, even though we sometimes are self-reliant, never turn on help when it's offered, but also to give help even when we think we shouldn't. Father, we, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Help us to never forget this and 
live a life that shows how thankful we are. We thank you for all the wonderful blessings you've given us. Help us to use those blessings to further your cause and bring praise to you. We ask that you please forgive us when we do wrong. Help us to be stronger each and every day. Help us to study so that we know we can be good Christians and show ourselves approved unto you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.